Alright folks, let's go ahead and hop into it, shall we? Um, okay, so today's write stream topic uh, is going to be action, how to write action scenes, how to um, show action if you're drawing a comic or if you are um, either writing a screenplay or producing a movie. I want to look at all, um, all different forms of media because they all have certain things in common, so when you um, when you watch a movie, you're going to see some of these things that I'm going to talk about. When you read a book, you're going to see some of the things that I'm going to talk about, and you should be able to see them um, if you're reading a comic or a graphic novel uh, as well. And um, before I get to it, I think there was one question that went out before um, before the stream went live, uh, and I want to answer it. Um, have you considered writing or have you written books for children and or young readers? I have. Gary Mission, The Farmer's a Fairy Tale, you can get for free on Amazon. Um, and as far as a longer novel for younger readers, I don't know. I don't have one planned right now, but that doesn't mean I won't write one. Um, so let's talk about action. So action and action scenes, this is where stuff be happening, where people are fighting. Usually there's a conflict involved. Um, something dangerous is happening. Uh, there's a lot of events that stack up. And so... I've gotten this question a couple times and I've got a recent one. Hey, have you ever addressed how to write action scenes? Um, because a, being able to execute a good action scene is going to keep your reader interested in what you're doing. And depending on what genre you're writing in, action is going to take up a large portion of the book. Um, or if you're creating a, a book, uh, a graphic novel, a comic book, it's going to take up probably the majority of what you're doing. And the dialogue that's in the peaceful moments actually takes up less page space than when you're when you're drawing action. So that's an interesting thing to think about with comics. Uh, and with movies, it can vary depending on the genre as well. So here's the big ideas that I want to put out for you regarding action before I start taking every question and we let people kind of get in on this. Um, the key to executing good action is not just the execution, uh, meaning if you're writing prose, it's not just the way that you write prose. Um, it's actually the things that happen before and after the action and in between events. So when you're writing an action scene, you're essentially describing a series of events. Um, and it could be something as simple as like Mike got down off the roof and chased after this guy who stole his bike, right? Now you could just say that, but if you're going to try to ride it, you're usually going to put a little bit more than Mike got down off the roof and chased the guy who stole his bike. You're going to want to put some more things in there. So the big idea, and this goes across all mediums, is that there's a anticipatory moment that you're going to portray. So there's anticipation, there's event, then there's consequence and reaction. 
And that's the way that each event should be structured. And it's more about how you put the things on the, the bookends, the anticipation and the consequence um, that ends up making people have an attachment or feeling excited and feeling good uh, about the way that you portrayed your action, more so than the specific ways you execute the moment of impact. Um, and these things become even more important with certain genres like Westerns. So with a Western, the actual act of, say, drawing your pistol and shooting is a far less involved uh moment it, there's a whole lot less to describe than the moments that occur before and after because the moments that b occur before and after the anticipation there's a large amount of drama and then in the consequence there's a very large amount of drama uh, and i'm going to show a couple of movie clips uh, during this little presentation to, to let you know what i mean uh, but whether you're writing westerns or you're showing westerns you're going to put more in the anticipation moment than the actual moment um, likewise if you're writing something that has a duel like a sword duel which i've written um you actually tend to front load the anticipation because you want there to be a high amount of tension for the reader to have to resolve then you have the the event happen which is going to resolve the tension and then um the resolution of the tension or the consequence of it you have another emotional reaction um so let's take a look at a western real quick because i think uh, that would actually be be quite fun to look at. So uh, I picked one that I thought might be fun to look at called Quickly Down Under. This is the last gunfight scene from Quickly Down Under, which is a western starring Tom Selleck and Alec Rick, Alan Rickman. Um, and basically, he's in Australia, and they want him to shoot Aborigines, and and he's like, nah. And so he decides to to kill his employers instead. So in this last scene, you have this character throughout the movie that is. Um, uh, always using this high-powered rifle at a distance uh, rather than using a pistol like what we would expect cowboys to use a six gun. Um, and so what we get here is we get a little bit of something different. So let's take a look at it. Uh, Flynn, go and get my second revolver. I don't know how much you'd like to have your rifle with you at this moment, Mr. Quigley, but I think you'll find that I've got a much better idea. Stick it in his belt. Go on. So, Alan Rickman's character wants to have a gunfight. This is part of the anticipation. And you can see with Tom Selleck, you know, they've thrown dirt on him. I seem to remember you're not too familiar with Colonel Colt's revolver, so this will be your first lesson. Don't worry. Mr. Dobkin and Mr. O'Flynn will ensure that it's a fair contest. So he wants him to have a cowboy gunfight. And it's kind of part of Alan Rickman's character in this movie. And you'll notice in the in the gunfight scene, it's mostly just standing around looking in drama. Now right in front of my old pistol target. Some men are born in the wrong century. I think I was born on the wrong continent. <laughs> Oh, by the way, you're fired. Very spaghetti western, just having shots of the of people's faces. Wow. This ain't Dodge City. Wow. And you ain't Bill Hickok. So you notice, I'm going to pause it real quick, you notice that the action actually wasn't all that clear. You see him draw the pistol, you hear the gun, and then you see reactions. Um, but you don't see a whole lot of clarity of exactly how he uh, how he manipulated that pistol. And if I back it up just a, a couple of frames, the action occurs just in a, in a few frames. And that's all you really get to see of it. Because it's a lot more about what's on either side that makes the good uh, that makes that good moment. Actually, I love this the way that this uh, this scene happens to end.
Said I never had much use for one. Never said I didn't know how to use it. So there's a big revelation there in terms of um, what the character was. Because you see him using this rifle the whole movie. And so the last gunfight, they, they're like, well, we'll make him use a revolver and it'll it'll be like a taunting um, opportunity. And instead, he's an expert with a revolver as well. And he said, uh, I said I never had much use for one. I never said I didn't know how to use it. Um, which was a, a kind of a gotcha at the end of the movie and worked pretty well. So that's a, a really extreme example where the bookends are matter so much more than the actual action. Um, but you see this in a number of movies um, where, where the bookends become so much more important than the actual way that the action is executed. Um, uh, and you could, you could actually see this in movies like Star Wars and things like that as well. Um, there's much more tension built around, like if you're watching the Death Star scene, there's a lot more tension that's built around coming in to shoot the torpedoes than there is shooting the torpedoes. Um, there's a lot of shots of ships moving around, um, and and you feel excited and you feel anxious about it because that's that's the, the actual way that it's executed. Um, and so when you write in prose, you do some of the same things. So if you're writing in prose, and I think I... I can use maybe one of my books as an example. Um, so when you're writing in prose, what you tend to do is you um, you want to have that that moment that happens beforehand, and you want to have the actual action pops out. Let me do. Uh, I'll do Needle Ash. This is the new edition of Needle Ash, by the way, the single volume one. It's got this big proof stripe on it. So if you order this, this will be. I'll probably have it come out Friday if you want to buy it, and you get the ebook for free if you want the nice thick paperback or the nice uh, big uh, nine by or six by nine paperback that should go with Water of Awakening pretty nicely. Um, that one's coming out. Let me find this dual scene because that's a, that's a pretty good example of how I do it. Um, and one of the, I actually have gotten some criticism for the way that I have this dual and then it happens um, too quickly. Um, but for me, and here's a little illustration of it. Um, for me, it's it's really that you want the tension to happen on either side. And so action is one of the things that I tend to try to clean up a lot in my uh, revisions. Um, because when, um, when you're writing the action, you're usually trying to describe something that you visualize. That's the way that I write all of my action. I'm describing something that I, I'm imagining visually happening. And so if you're not really clear on that, then that's something that'll be apparent when you go back and read it again or you have somebody else read it. They're like, I didn't know what happened there. And it may have been very clear in your mind what was supposed to happen, but that doesn't mean it translates into the actual book all that well. So let me see if I can find this little part. Um, the two combatants circled one another, eyes locked, the twisting shadows of the tree limbs writhing over their faces. Michael took in his opponent, who was taller and broader than him, his glowing eyes foreign and difficult to read. He still detected in those eyes a mania, which some part of the back of his mind thought would be frightening to most men. To Michael, the mania was an opportunity. He focused on slowly slowing his breathing, keeping his nerves under control. Porthal's two swords were masterworks, black with keen, bright single edges, a basket hilt protecting each gloved hand. The elf laughed hoarsely and rubbed his swords as if preparing to carve a turkey. Michael's bastard sword was longer than each of those, and he had trained himself to use it single-handedly as well as double. He had the reach advantage, and for whatever lust lived behind Porthal's eyes, the elf guessed this, or he would not be hesitating. Michael switched from a forward guard to an overhead guard, and Porthal dashed forward, slashing with both swords at once, one swinging high, the other low. Michael leapt back, turning his sword for a quick slash at Porthal's arms. The elf turned his body and stepped backward nimbly, and they circled again. So notice everything left up to one interchange, right? That's like three paragraphs going to, he came and swung sword like this, and Michael jumped back and then tried to hit him, and then the other, the two separated. So all that, all those words to describe one thing, but there's a lot that's going on there that's not the sword swinging at each other, right? Um, and I'll talk about word, word painting because the way that you execute word painting can have a lot to do with how people perceive the action as well. So you wouldn't just say like, um, they looked at each other and then they had a sword fight, right? Or something, or they looked at each other and then the swords swung at each other, something like that. Um, 
I describe the swords, right? So the description of the swords matters because imagine that you're a cinematographer and you focus on the handle of that gun. It's the same idea, right? You're focusing on the object to make the person really feel the danger of that object. The two swords were masterworks, black with keen, bright single edges. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have a little bit of emotion there. So in each of those three things, the anticipation, the event, and the consequence, you want to have emotion that's in those or some some sort of way that you're communicating either someone feeling emotion or the audience's ability to feel emotion. Um, so he laughed hoarsely or he detected behind his eyes a mania. And so the mania means that we should be afraid, but Michael sees it as like this, this guy is unbalanced and therefore he'll make mistakes. And so you communicate that as well. Um, and so Michael's, you know, through this, Michael realizes he has the reach advantage and his opponent, he knows his opponent knows this because he's gauging his opponent's, um, his opponent's action. So they have one interchange and then he goes on. Michael took a breath and his, his thoughts racing with possibilities. His mind evaluated every move from the flick of the sword tips to the assassin's light footwork. One detail stood out. This is your last chance, Michael said. Don't make me kill you. Porthal laughed and rushed forward. It played out as Michael had imagined. Porthal flourished his swords in an attempt to confuse him, then attacked with both at once, one high and one low, each with a different arc, in a way that would be impossible to parry or counter normally. Michael lifted his right foot and caught the lower sword with the heel of his boot, the old stiff leather capturing the keen edge of the black sword like a piece of green wood as the blade bit in. Michael turned his own sword down from his overhead guard and blocked Porthal's upper attack. The swords rang like bells, then sang as steel slid against steel. With a quick turn of his wrist, Michael directed the elf's blow over and away from his body, and with the same motion slammed his bastard sword into Porthal's neck. Porthal was wearing no gorget, but had a simple male coif around his head and neck. The links burst as the strong of the sword crushed Porthal's clavicle. The elf cried slightly, shocked, and his right arm seemed to collapse at the sudden loss of strength. His eyes grew to a bright white. With a quick withdrawal, Michael gripped his sword halfway along its length, then swiftly sent the sharp tip of his sword into Porthal's neck splitting the already broken mail, parting the jack, and severing the elf's carteroid, ar carteroid artery, artery. There we go. Sorry. Um, so the I go through some like extreme detail with that particular moment. And this is something I did with the revision, is that we went a little too quickly past the details, and it wasn't clear what he was doing. Because uh, I said half-sorted. Half-sorted was a term I used in the, original, the first edition. And some people don't know what half-sorting is. It's where you grip the sword halfway along its length. And if you're using a, a long sword, it has a springy kind of, you know, it, it bends. It's not stiff like a katana. So he grabbed it halfway through and he directed that razor point, split through the mail, and cut him right at the neck. And that's how he killed him. Then here's the part that afterwards. So that's the, the moment there is really two little paragraphs. And then a huge paragraph that's the anticipation of it. Um, Porthal grunted and swung wildly, frantically, with the sword in his left hand as Michael stepped away. The elf took a step, then fell to his knees, dropping his swords. He swayed for a moment, gazing at nothing, then fell over sideways. His eyes were shocked open, trembling, but he did not move. He stared up at Michael, surprised, and for a few seconds that seemed to stretch until Michael thought time itself would snap. Michael gazed back, feeling a wave of sudden sadness break over his heart, drowning his anger. Then the inner light of Porthal's eyes slowly drained, going from white to pale blue, and he lay still. And so it is done, Mondal said coolly. All right, so there's the emotion afterwards, and then there's more emotion afterwards, so um, even after this, because his, this elf's brother is there witnessing it and has what you might consider a very, not very strong reaction. But that's part of the weirdness of these um, these demi-humans, these, these dark elves. So when I'm executing the prose there, one thing you might notice, and a lot of authors do this, rather than saying, let me give you an example. Um, rather than saying his eyes were open as he lay on the ground, which you could say, and that works, said his, um, his eyes were shocked open we added a little color word in there. Trembling, meaning that there was life in them. You know, if you've ever seen eyes tremble because somebody is extremely sad or afraid, but he did not move. So 
the eyes are the only thing moving, you know. Um, he swayed for a moment, gazing at nothing, then fell over sideways. Well, what does gazing at nothing mean? We get the idea that his eyes are unfocused and not clearly looking at anything in the environment, meaning he's dying. Like, we get that idea. Um, you know, Michael gazed back, feeling a wave of sudden sadness break over his heart, drowning his anger. So he approached it with anger, but after it's done, the anger leaves and he feels sad. So there's, you're, you're communicating emotion there. And so the, what bookends the actual action is a little bit better than what book in than uh, the action itself. It's what gives the action impact. Is the things that happened before and the things that happened afterwards. And it's more important for your action to have impact than for it to be described with really great prose. And and maybe my prose is good. Maybe it's not good. But um, I try to make it good. But I try to have those emotions happen before and after. And that's how they're going to end up having uh, hopefully a good impact. Um, now, when I describe certain things, like they're very technical. Michael gripped his sword halfway along its length and swiftly sent the sharp tip of his sword into Porthold's neck, splitting the already broken mail, parting the jack, and severing the elf's carotid, arter carotid artery. Carotid artery. There we go. Oh. I can write the word, but I sometimes I can't say it. Um, so that's just a very technical description of what happened. And I noticed I didn't use any like florid language. I, I think the, the only color word was like swiftly. He swiftly sent it in. Um, but that's all you need. You need to describe it accurately so that the reader knows what happened and that the impact comes before and after more than, more than in that. But you can also put color, uh, color words into something, uh, as you're, as you're writing it. So like, imagine you have an assassin, he's going to break someone's neck, right? So he pulled on his neck until he heard a sickening pop. The word sickening is that addition in there. He pulled on the neck till he heard a pop or he pulled on the dude's neck until it broke would be boring. But if he pulled on the neck until he heard a sickening pop, the sickening has emotion in it. That means that the assassin who's breaking his neck feels kind of sickened by the pop versus you could also say satisfying. Satis he pulled on the neck till he heard a satisfying pop, meaning he's enjoying what he's doing versus a sickening pop. He's not enjoying what he's doing, but he knows he has to, has to do it. Just a single word uh, interchange there in that sentence can make a huge difference in the how the action is perceived um, by the reader. Okay, let me take a look at some of the um, let me take a look at some of the the chat and see if there's any questions, and then we'll look at um, maybe another couple clips, or actually we'll look at a comic, and then we'll look maybe at some more movies, and we'll see this same thing. Um, it's it's prelude to the action, it's anticipation, action, and then consequence. Great question. Any advice for writing action in a screenplay? You should, you're should. you going to write it in present tense because it's a screenplay. The question is, do you want to write very descriptive action the way that, that this, you know, the way that I wrote it in this book? Or are you going to leave that up the, to the director? It's better to write it and have the director ignore it than it is to not write it because the point of a screenplay is to sell itself. So if there's something that you're imagining visually when you write the action, write that in there. So if that were to be a screenplay rather than having that, it would be Porthol, Porthol and Michael circle one another. Porthol swings his swords menacingly and laughs um, maniacally. He dashes in, Michael jumps back and parries one of the swords. And you, you would describe it like that. And that way, when you're describing it, you're getting, you're getting, you're you're helping the director visualize exactly what's there. Some some people who are writing screenplays would say, well, they duel and Porthol is killed. I wouldn't do that. I would actually put like all those little details because the director can always throw those out and be like, I'm imagining something different. And then you can say, well, you know, you are the person mastering. You know, you're, you're mastering the execution, so you get to decide how the blocking is going to happen. The the action in a screenplay is there as a guide. It's not absolute, but you do want to have it there because you want the director to read the screenplay and imagine what you're imagining and be like, oh, I'm imagining something that's good. And yeah, it'll come out a little bit different in execution, but the point is that, that you're giving enough direction there. You don't want to put um, camera directions like camera pans. Um, you want to probably avoid that 
but you want to describe what happens just like in a book and you leave the camera and the cinematography decisions up to the crew that are actually going to be shooting the story um, uh, unless you're writing the the screenplay purely for yourself to then direct in which case you could put them in there or not uh, because you're working off your own script um, okay real quick super chat is uh, is it pivotal to study the rules of engagement dynamics and the nature of fight knowing the difference between close quarters and long range for competency I'm not sure if that's a question or a statement, but it is pretty it is pretty pivotal depending on what you're doing. So rules of engagement is kind of a newer concept. So if you're writing n anything with newer military ideas, then knowing a rule of engagement of how you determine it's okay to engage the enemy and you're going to be taking an aggressive stance towards them. If you were doing something in the Middle Ages, there were no rules of engagement per se. Uh, everything was left up to whatever senior officer was in command at any particular skirmish most things were skirmishes uh, just like they are in, in modern context you didn't have these big battles where everybody's running into the center and mixing it up um, very much what you had was a lot of prolonged skirmishes and then maybe one big battle that settled everything not everything was waterloo back in the day so yeah knowing the rules of engagement or or how that's going to happen that's that's probably pretty good um, and the difference between close quarters and long range um, is a big deal and there's even there's even systematized things when it comes to range as well um, just as an example um, you know if you guys know uh, you know medieval Japan samurais wore two swords which is called the Daisho um, which was a, a, a katana or katana and a, a wakazashi which is a shorter sword and so traditionally you would put aside your katana when you walked indoors but you would keep your wakazashi which was um somewhere but you could think of it somewhere between a dagger and a short sword right it was a short it was a short sword and it's like why would you keep it well you kept it partly so that you're armed but also because a long sword is not very useful in really tight quarters like the inside of a of somebody's home or a hallway um, so you still had a weapon that was usable in those spaces. Otherwise, you would set aside, you know, obviously a spear is not going to work very well in a house. Um, now, a spear could work well if you're in a hallway and someone's trying to come down the hallway, but all they have to do is defeat the point of the spear, like get it to the side, and you're, you're pretty much open. Whereas if you have some sort of secondary weapon, a shorter weapon, then it's a little bit harder to get past someone. Like it's harder to get, it's hard to get past someone with a knife in the hallway. Uh, like in a horror movie, you know, that's really hard because like they can stab you. Um, whereas if somebody's got a spear in the hallway, it's actually not, wouldn't be that hard. But on the battlefield where somebody can actually walk around, run in different directions, back up, a, the spear is is the best weapon. The spear is the, is the primary weapon of war. Um, all right, let's go on and see if there's any other, any other ones. Um... Could certain scenes, events, or actions be greatly exaggerated, such as the fight um, uh, and they live? I'm not sure if I understand that one exactly. Let's see here. Good twist and quickly done under. Yes. It's one of my favorite final gunfight scenes in a Western. And I, I really do love Westerns like books and movies because they do this well. They have that drama that surrounds it. And I also just like really gritty um really really gritty masculine characters which westerns are full of um it's like one of the last genres where you get really uh you know you get men that really exemplify manhood uh on all sides and what makes a man bad is not it's it's his uh it's his moral fortitude not his like lack of courage or his lack of foolhardiness it's his moral this is moral convictions I'm personally a fan of obscure color words. I feel like I should need a dictionary every now and then. Yeah, um, you can do use words that are too obscure. And I'm trying to think. Um, the name of the author escapes me, but he wrote the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, which is uh, a very interesting fantasy series. I need to do some content on. I don't know if I recommend it or not, but he will often pull these words out, like in and. And the word is exceptionally rare compared to all his other language. So you don't feel like you're reading something from the 18th century where you're like, I'm not sure what that word means. Or <clears throat> this is an interesting grammar choice. Instead, it's like 
you have to get a dictionary out for a word. It's like um, sometimes it's good to avoid them if they're too obscure. And I, I, I fall prey to this because sometimes things that – words that I use and understand regularly, like half sorting. Um, I know what half sorting is. Lots of readers don't because they're not they're not into it on that level. So they're like, "What is? What do you mean he half sorted? Like he broke his sword in half? Oh no, he he gripped it on the strong, or what the strong of the sword is? I should probably explain that at some point. But like the strong of the sword is like that that center of percussion on the sword, the best place to break someone's collarbone. Um, let's see if there's more stuff here. <clears throat> Um, what's the best way to get across the idea that someone of a lesser skill is up against someone more skilled in a fight? Okay, well, there's a lot of ways to get that across. So, uh, one of the one of the ways is that you can have an interchange. So, if it's a two person fight, I don't know, maybe they're having a fist fight. The underdog does what he normally does, and it just doesn't work. You know, like the um, maybe it's a boxing match, like. What, and uh, and so he does his normal thing where like he jabs and, and throws a right hook and the boxer just like and then and quickly counters him and he's like left reeling. And so you communicate that and in pros you can just say that. It's like um, um, Billy felt his, his back hit the hit the ropes and he and he bounced away in time to miss another another flurry of fists. Um, at that point, he realized he was out of his depth, you know, or he he had a sudden thought, "Why did I take this fight?" <laughs> you know, um, so you've communicated that he's really out of his depth. In in terms of movies, you just have to show that, or a comic, you just have to show that um, he's like he's like, "I got you now," and he swings and he misses, and it's just air, and the other guy's like moved around behind him, and it's like hitting him in the side of the head. Uh, so you got to show you got to show that that uh, the main character or the character who's lesser skill is gonna gonna hit the better the worse end of it before the end of the fight and then you can have the hero think of something clever to get around it this is a really common trope in comics um so we'll get to that Let, let's actually take a look at a comic because you're gonna see the same thing happen um you're gonna see the exact same thing happen in comics so here is um Venom number one. Now, I actually own this comic um, back from the 1990s. This was 1994. No, 1992. 1992. But I can't find my comics right now because I moved. They're in a box somewhere. But I like this one because it starts with action and because there's some funny things for 2019. So now he, you know, first of all, the cover has Spider Man emoting. It's just funny. All right. San Francisco, fabled city by the bay, the jewel in Northern California's cultural crown. It's very funny to read that in 2019, that, uh, that San Francisco is a jewel in any crown. From the hippie movement of the 60s to human rights struggles in the 90s. <laughs> well, they got a human rights struggle right now called waves of defecation flowing through the gutters. <laughs> <laughs> has long been a mecca of creativity, a haven of freedom. But as with most urban areas in this modern age, there are always those who seek more freedom than the law allows. Now, if, if I were to read that, more freedom than the law allows, it'd be like somebody experimenting on dogs or like somebody having crazy orgies because that happens in San Francisco. No, this freedom is just a guy being a thief. Um, and so in the 90s, you always drew thieves. They had like mohawks and wacky hair and they never had sleeves and their jeans were always in a terrible state of disrepair. <laughs> this ain't nothing but chump change, lady. Now you notice that even though this is a really small face, uh, there's a lot of fear uh, that's communicated there. Um, and uh, maybe I'll have to take my pay some other way. So he's threatening to rape her. I don't know if this would fly in 2019. Another reason why I was thinking of this comic. That scare you? Good. Right. Uh, and, no, you know, her eyes are, are pointed away. So before we get a lot of action, we're, we're having a lot of emotion, right? So here's emotion, action, and a reaction, right? So the action, we actually don't see the action between these two panels of him running up and putting his hand on her mouth. But we see the reaction of her fear and he's taking pleasure in it. Then we have another anticipation. 
And the anticipation is with the reader because we see that we see the scary face of Venom, um, and uh, notice that the his mouth is is white for some reason. Uh, that's because when you draw Venom as a silhouette, how do you differentiate between the teeth and the, you know the, if this was uh, black, it would look weird. So I assume the colorist was like, we can't do this be black, so we'll we'll have it be blue or something. Um, and notice that he's got a very sadistic look on his face. There's emotion in this anticipation. I always like seeing fear in my victim's eyes, right? Uh, and then he communicates it with dialogue. Um, you actually wouldn't need this dialogue at all. Like you could understand the scene with no dialogue at all. Um, and this is another thing that I like about these 90s comics is how heavy the inking is. They've gone away from this heavy inking, but heavy inking on like a face like this it just makes him look just so wicked um stanley presents venom what a coincidence so do we now we have action he's springing forward and then we have a reaction what <laughs> he's you know he's afraid and she's also still afraid and survive and surprised um this is another thing i like about 90s comics look at his calf muscle Look at the exaggerated proportions that they used on all these 90s characters. Um, and the feet, you know, the feet, like, this isn't a, this isn't much of, this is like a necktie, not a foot. Um, but yeah, you get this calf that's just wildly out of proportion to the rest of his body. Um, not, not that these artists were bad, but they just really went for these emotive kind of stances back then rather than having things be accurate. And it's not like this cowboy curved leg. You are despicable, you and all your kind. So here's an action. And while this action's happening, there's an emotion of pain uh, that we see. And we also get some sadism from Venom. And we have fear in his in his eyes. So notice you have just a reversal of this right here. So it's just a reversal of this. Pain and death. You make me sick. Oh, you make us sick. What? And then he kills the dude, right? So we see the black stuff going into his mouth and we skip the part where he's dead. And instead we just see his like lifeless body falling to the ground. And we see that she's rather freaked out by it. She hasn't stopped being scared about this. Um, and he has a little bit of a soliloquy. And then he, he, uh, he picks up the purse and gives it to the girl. And of course she's terrified and revolted by it. Because he's, the whole point of this is to show that he's like the same as the, the criminal. But you can see over and over again, you have this anticipation, action, reaction. Uh, action, reaction. Anticipation, action, reaction. That's what happens over and over and over again. So if you're drawing a comic, it's the same principles as if you're writing a book. You, you don't get um, uh, a different set of things. In fact, in, in notice in some of those panels, the action part is missing. It's just the anticipation and the reaction, and your mind just fills in whatever the action was there. They didn't even have to draw the action uh, for you to understand what was happening. So with that, let me see if I can get some more questions in here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What do you think the main problem is regarding the action of the new Star Wars movies? It happens too quickly so you don't see it. And um, because everything is happening so quickly, they also don't set it up. And there's also no stakes for any of it. So no stakes is part of the anticipation part. The anticipation part, you're setting up the stakes. Or the stakes are being established before that. And you're just reiterating them. Uh, then the action happens and then there's a consequence. So in a lot of cases in Star Wars, the new Star Wars, there's nothing at stake the action isn't clear, and then there's no consequence to the action uh, in some cases, right? Um, so, you know, that not that that isn't the case all the way through it, right? There is a lot of good action in the newer Star Wars movies. But once you have everything contextualized after the fact, you're kind of like, well, that was, that was kind of meaningless. Um, a good example would be like the attack on Starkiller Base where... They're trying to do too many things at once, so the anticipations are all mixed up, and the consequences are all mixed up. So they're they're trying to have a few go on where you have you have lots of different things going on, and it, it doesn't end up panning out nearly as well as it would in the older ones where you have mostly one thing going on. Um, although a competent director can do that because they did that in Return of the Jedi. Final scenes of Return of the Jedi are quite tense and easy to understand what's happening. 
Uh, do you think it's better to be a, uh, be detailed or more vague in action scenes if they're not the focus of the narrative? So, I can't answer that question, but I can tell you that if you're too detailed, people will skip ahead. So if you have a lot of tension in a scene and you're taking a long time to describe the action, readers will skip ahead to figure out what happens. And do you want them to do that? If they're doing that, that means you're probably taking too long to get to that release of tension. Um, so it, it just depends. If there's no impact, if there's no value to that, if it's just an event that's happening in a scene, you don't need to, to spend a lot of time focusing on it and, and creating this little setup um, setup to it. So, you know, if, if it's a couple characters and then, you know, somebody over there fights and dies, some other side character, just to kind of let you know they're in a battle, you know, they're, you know, they're shooting phasers at each other over there. You don't have to have this amount of detail. You just say like, you know, um, Kirk looked over and saw Ensign Redshirt uh, be vaporized by... Uh, uh, you know, vaporized by a Klingon, a Klingon phaser from a group of warriors that just entered the corridor, right? So that's what you might say. Um, and then the, the real tension is going to happen when Kirk fights them, not when Ensign Redshirt gets blast, blown away. He's just there to die to let you know that there's danger in what you're doing. So um, it just kind of depends on what you're doing. I'd say if it's if it's if if that event needs to have impact, you need to focus on it. Um. How would you describe guns? Gunshots, artillery shell sounds, airplane sounds. I'm having trouble describing uh, like an MP40 versus a Luger or a Sten. Sounds and imagery. Wow, that's a good question. So I did I did do a video quite a while back called Don't Be a Gun Noob um, that, that went through a lot of details on guns. Um, as far as choosing words, you have to be really familiar with what guns sound like. And so if you don't know what a gun sounds like, you're not going to describe one well. And so it's very apparent to me when I when I read writing from people that don't know anything about guns trying to write about guns, I just say skip trying to, to be detailed if you don't know what those details actually are and instead just describe it clearly, right? So if you have if you have a machine gun of some kind, you can just say he heard the quick cadence of a machine gun. Machine guns are fast, right? So you don't have to think any more than that, right? Um, versus a very particular kind of machine gun that has a particular cadence, that has a particular sound, that they're in a place that echoes in a particular way um you know he could hear like if you know how guns work there's a lot more stuff that you can put into it uh, but if you didn't you know if you're not intimately familiar with a lot of the firearms you're using uh, just skip some of the descriptions and a lot of those descriptions aren't going to negatively i mean aren't going to positively impact the story anyway um there's there's some people that are really into super details with guns but yeah, you know, most people don't care that much, and even the people who are really into guns aren't going to be like, "Why didn't he stop and describe?" You know, why didn't he stop and describe this element of the gun or this part, this the way that this sounds? Because I know the way, you know, I I can tell you the way that different guns sound because I've shot them all over multiple decades in my life, many times, right? But I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't describe something really obscure. Uh, and I also probably wouldn't bother. So if you don't know, then just keep it simple. Uh, just just say that it, you know, um, a, a small arms, something like, quote, a Luger, uh, a 9 millimeter pistol, is going to have a different report than a long gun. And there's a different sound to it, but you don't need to... Uh, you don't need to explain it. If the, if the character knows the difference, then he can clue the reader in. You know, Mike heard the, Mike heard the, the, you know, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe like a, a nine millimeter, you know, Mike heard the slow cadence and uh, high pitched whinny of a, no, I wouldn't even do that. And it's like Mike heard what was clearly a Luger, you know, I would just say Mike heard what was clearly a Luger. Mike heard what was clearly a nine millimeter. Um, Mike heard the roar of a 45. You know, you could use a word like roar. If it's a bigger gun, it roars. 
if it's a smaller gun, it um, maybe it sings or something. I don't know. But you, you can always do uh, a blast, a shotgun blast. Uh, people imagine that shotguns... Because they have a big hole at the end, <laughs> they imagine that shotguns are like louder and and you know people have a lot of bad ideas about guns. So if you if you haven't spent time shooting guns, you can go do that. Everyone should do that. But maybe you live in a place where like you can't do that. Just say that. Just say what the character knows it to be, um, and I would skip the color because it's really easy to to piss off gun nets. People that are gun pedants like me, we know. We know like right away. Let's see here. Any more questions? What do you make of the gunfight from open range? Would you say it's a good model from both a setup payoff as well as the actual execution of the action? I like the gunfight from open range a lot. My dad liked it a lot when he saw it um, when he was alive. It was one of his favorites. And one of the reasons is that it has a slower pace, um, which if you're not, you know, there's it's it's very tropic in westerns to have have a duel where it's like they like shoot at the same time but in a real gunfight with these older weapons you actually you know the the first person to empty a cylinder is usually the first person dead so you actually have to be pretty cautious with the way that you uh, that you fire and the fact that kevin costner shot first that actually is a big deal because you always want to you always want to be the one who's able to shoot first if it's possible because that's one person you eliminate from the fight. So that shows the competency of those characters um, when they got through the entire gunfight. So I really like that one. It's it's quite a good one. And it's a very it's a little bit of a different take um, from Westerns. A little bit slower paced, but that gives you a little more time for the drama. Um, from Kaku, further context, John Carpenter's They Live, the fight scene between Roddy Piper and Keith Richards, bear attack in the Revent. How long can you drag out action? I don't know. I, so if you if you give somebody no release, um, viewers become exhausted or readers become exhausted as well. Um, so there needs to be some breaks from the action or people will, will feel too anxious about it and want to turn it off. Um, or, you know, you can have the opposite effect where people get bored of it. You don't want either one of those. So if you're if you're doing a horror movie and, like, you never have the monster jump out, people will perceive it as boring. Monster has to jump out from time to time. And then there has to be a couple times where people feel safe enough to talk about stuff. Um, so I'm not, I don't know of any hard and fast rules. You kind of have to feel it out. Um, but if you, if, if you do it too much, then people will get bored or... or get tired of feeling anxious and turn it off <laughs> okay i've seen some reactions to the venom comic which is fun <laughs> yeah the comic would never be ripped <laughs> would never be written today it just wouldn't <laughs> oh yeah best action scenes the duelist we're going to look at a duelist scene in just a minute here um I've heard that a big problem with today's action scenes is that shots are too rapid and they cut away from the impact. Absolutely. They don't show the impact or they cut from it too quickly or they don't spend time setting up the importance of the action. So like I said, it's what goes on either side of the action is way more important than the way you execute it. As we saw in that quickly scene, the, a the action wasn't even that clear. What matters is what people were saying on either side of it, um, of the action. That's what really mattered. Um, I have a theory that a franchise or content creator can have a downfall because of a bloated sense of genius or self-importance after years of praise. I think that is, I think that can be pretty accurate. Um, the other thing is, if you just look at Star Wars, a black swan, lightning in a bottle, whatever you want to call it, when you have a mega success, it's, it's impossible. It's virtually impossible to produce something just as good as a follow-up it's almost impossible there's very very few exceptions where sequels are ever as good as the the first one because the first one has to be really successful to justify a sequel um but it's really really rare and it's really rare that the end of a series is as good as the beginning and that's because um you can't predict like a giant leap in positive reaction and attention for something. So I don't think George Lucas had like a bloated sense of self-importance. 
or anything like that. Um, as time went on, people people write it that way. But I think it's just if you look at all his movies, right? They're all pretty good. But the first Star Wars movie was like way better, and it was way better almost by accident, right? It it contained a lot of the same elements from all his other movies. It had big ideas like all his other movies. But it was just the right combination of things, the right time, the right people involved. Everything was right about that first Star Wars movie. So it's impossible to expect it to be equaled. You can just expect it to be... I mean, what you can really expect is for George Lucas to be somewhere in the average of what he always did. And that's kind of how I feel about all of George Lucas's movies that he was involved in. He does a lot of really good movies. Um, So maybe episode one wasn't as good as, you know... The first Star Wars movie, of course not, right? But was it as good as Willow? It probably wasn't as good as Willow. Um, you know, it was probably better than Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? So uh, other projects that he's worked on may have been worse than Episode One. Um, I don't think I don't think it's a, a fault of his, but it's totally possible to have that. Um, and I think you can get that. I see that sometimes in music, right? Like a, like with Queensrÿche. It's like Queensryche had these great albums in the 80s and then um, Jeff Tate just thought he was like the best thing ever and never improved and like the band just kept going downhill, you know, replaying songs from Operation Mindcrime um, because that's what people wanted to hear live and never really doing anything until they kicked him out of the band, right? So it's I think that's I think there's a truth to that, um, but it usually happens because their success originally happens because they're not uh, they're not as good as people think they are. You know, the the that one standout work is is better than what they usually do. Yeah, the okay, so from uh, Sir Styles of Moxley Jr. Um, for me the longer the action scene is without cuts the better it is and no shaky flailing cam. It just looks bad. I hate shaky cam. Like there's no reason to obscure the action. Um, you're not increasing the tension by having the the camera shake about wildly. And this is a trick from like Star Trek, right? Because it's like we get hit by a torpedo. Oh no! It's like full phasers, you know. Um, that that stuff is is just an old trick to show what you can't actually have happen, which is the entire room rumble. But yeah, why why obscure the action? It's not really about the action. It's about what happens on either side of it. And so I think a lot of modern makers just forget that. Um, this is really off topic. I'll maybe answer towards the end. Um, did you see Mike Cernovich's recent tweet about wanting Islam instead of Christianity in America? Um, we can maybe talk about that at the end. Let's, let's try to stay on topic. Um, the scene in Lord of the Rings where Gandalf fights the Balrog is described so well. It really is. Um... um I muted Cernovich. Okay, we'll talk about Cernovich later. Um, <laughs> if, you're work- if you're working with certain guns like a Sten gun, you can also use the fact that it was a terribly constructed gun as a plot point. Yeah, guns fail really often, and you almost never see it in the movies or read it where, where like a, a gun misfires. But especially in the black powder days, the guns were so unreliable. You had, Have you ever heard the, the term a flash in the pan? Flash in the pan is where... Your flint strikes your priming charge, and your priming charge goes off, but it doesn't ignite the main charge inside the gun. So, you, so it just flashes and goes, and there's some smoke, and you're like, it didn't fire. I'm screwed. You have to stop, reprime it, hope it shoots again, and if it doesn't, you're going to have to pull the bullet, and, and your gun is just a useless hunk of metal. Um, so especially pre, pre-smokeless pre powder, things failed all the time all the time and with automatics you get stovepipes <coughs> you get all kinds of things that happen that are wrong um uh, uh sleeping narrative i'm gonna okay i always skip over a lot of the specific sounds of guns focusing on the character's interaction with his weapon he squeezed the trigger and the body downrange fell into the snow so i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you right now that you never squeeze triggers i'm i'm, I'm hearing my dad's ghost here and he was a he was a rifle instructor in the U.S. Army. Was one of his uh, his MOs for a while. Um, he says you squeeze lemons, you squeeze titties, you pull triggers, 
And he had a whole motion to it because squeezing is a is a different motion than pulling. And so if you're squeezing the trigger, you're always gonna pull your gun off to one side. Um, so if you're squeezing the trigger it between these fingers, he always had it, you know, you hold a pistol between and he was also he was also a championship marksman, by the way, too. Um, and you pull the trigger so the, the trigger is completely independent of what you're doing. So squeezing triggers, it's like you don't squeeze triggers. You pull triggers. Um, so I'm imagining it's not to not to like come down on you with that because no one would really care except for me. Um, and I, if someone writes that in a book, it actually doesn't bother me. But I just remembered, sorry, just remembered some things that my dad told me. Um, I know a guy who gets hired by authors to show them how to shoot special guns. One author was going to write a novel that had modern day weapons against dragons. Dragons are cool. All right, another super chat. I appreciate it from Kaku. Thoughts on breaking the fourth wall and action scenes? Um, I'm not sure. There's, I, I don't, I don't attempt to break the fourth wall and talk to the reader. But you can. I mean, there's no rule against it. People talk about it like it's something to be avoided, but you can do it if you want to. It depends on what you want what you want the impact to be uh i i read a book um i think it was called the gun seller it was by hugh laurie he did that pretty frequently where the character would just stop and like have a monologue in the middle of action i don't know it wasn't bad um it was mostly to like insert some humor um i know what you're thinking right um tolkien broke the fourth wall all the time he's like i know what you're thinking right now that this couldn't have happened this way you know it's like nowadays that would be frowned upon stylist stylistically but there's no reason it needs to be uh, in my opinion, you can just do do what you want. Um, if you want to break the fourth wall, um, so there's different ways that you can that you can kind of slip in fourth wall breaks that people aren't aware of. One is to have the character speak in his mind. Um, so speaking thoughts, I do that all the time. Um, it really is kind of a fourth wall break because the narrator is no longer neutral, right? The narrator then becomes for those thoughts the the character who's thinking. Um, and James Clavell would do this with shifting perspectives in one scene. They would be, there'd be internal monologue happening that, that breaks the wall and gives all kinds of extra details because you thought it was necessary for explaining the story. Um, and did that in all of his stories. So you can do it. I don't think there's anything bad about it. The only thing bad about it would be if you, if you do it in a way, or if it's the only time you ever do it, if you only do it one time. Then it stands out to readers. But if, if it's part of just your style, yeah, you can do it. You can break the fourth wall in action scenes or elsewhere. Um, okay. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Speaking of monsters, what would you say is the best way to describe someone fighting a monster with, let's say, a pair of 9mm Glocks? I'd get rid of the pair, right? Uh, Shooting two guns, one in each hand, is a is a fun idea, but no one really did it. You had a lot of cowboys that would have two guns. Why would you have two guns? They didn't really fire two guns, right? Because you can't aim. You know, they're in different planes of orientation. It's really hard to aim two guns. Why do they have two guns? It's because they were single action revolvers, and in order to reload them. You had to open up the cylinder and drop out each shell individually. I don't have my, I don't, I don't, I don't have a, a six gun anywhere near here, but maybe I'll show one sometime. Um, drop out each shell individually, and then put one in, and then cl close it back up. Then you may begin fighting. So you had two, so that when you ran out of one, you could keep. It gave you twelve shots instead of six. That's the main reason that you see these guys holding two guns, or you see old photos of Texas Rangers and they got like six different guns on them. Right, and that's before even the days of revolvers. It's because you want to be able to shoot more than once, and in order to shoot more than once, you gotta have more than one gun sometimes. Or, you know, if you want to shoot more than six times, you gotta have more than one gun. So I get rid of the pair right away. If I see people having pairs of guns, I think I'm a gun pedant, though. Keep that in mind. You're not always writing to me. Write to your audience. If your audience doesn't care, if your audience thinks dual wielding nine millimeter Glocks is cool. Um, and by the way, let's get back to the monster. It depends on the monster. So a nine millimeter is a small and not very powerful handgun round. 
you know, it's bigger than a 22, but it ain't that big. So if you're shooting a monster, I would have him shooting the monster with the Glocks and it not doing anything and realizing that his gun is not a significant enough threat uh, to defeat the skin of the monster. It just depends what you want to do, right? So, um, yeah, 9 millimeters are not very powerful. If you want him to have a powerful gun, at least like a 45 ACP, you know, um, or if not, go to like a hand cannon. <laughs> If you, if you want a monster killing gun, he should be shooting like a 454 or bigger, I don't know. You know, one of those one of those wildcat ones that's like a 700, you know, uh, that'll like knock the gun into your face if you if you're not holding on tight. <laughs> or people using like double barrel shotguns. What's cool about a double barrel shotgun is you can shoot both barrels at the same time if it's the old style with two triggers. Um, that's cool, but you wouldn't pick it as a defense weapon because you can only shoot two times at most. It's bad. You the more the more bullets you can fire, the better it is. So the advantage of a Glock would be that you could have an 18 round magazine. Uh, but that's a lot of shots. That's a lot of shots. That's a lot of chances to miss or to hit hit shoot them right in the eyes. Um, have you seen Aquaman? I haven't. I haven't been to a movie in a while. I really wanted to see Mortal Engines, not because I thought it was would be good, but because I thought it might have cool ideas. But we were moving in December, and I we went and saw The Grinch because the kids wanted to see it. So that's what I did a report on, and I'll try to get to more movies this spring. Uh, unfortunately, that's what happens sometimes in life. Is you get you get so busy you can't do it. Yeah, I know Lucas didn't direct Empire Strikes Back. He didn't direct Willow either, but he wrote all the stories for him. Yeah. So they're still, and he produced them. He was heavily involved in the Star Wars movies. He didn't just hand them off. But uh, Irving Kirshner did a great job directing Empire Strikes Back. It's one of the, um, I think it's, I think the formula of having another another director manage the production um, was probably a really good formula. Probably should have stuck with it for the for the prequels. Um over the years, I've been watching fewer movies and reading more books. Me too. I think, um, I'm not sure if it's just Hollywood pushing more trash or it's just getting an older thing. I think it's actually Hollywood pushing trash. Because I go back and I watch old movies that I haven't seen before. And I'm like, that movie was great. you know. Or I talk to my friends who are like, I don't like movies. I'm like, well, let's watch Patton. And they're like, I've never seen Patton. And then they get to the end like, what a great movie. It's like, yeah, movies used to be really good. And I think it's Hollywood movies stick to the formula too much. Um they're just not executed as well. It's a it's 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 going w as wide as possible, and that produces inherently a worse product for most people. That's just how it is, you know. Um, right? If you write something that everyone can understand and have a mild reaction to, then you're you're not going to have anyone that has a profound reaction to it. That's just how it is. <laughs> <laughs> the character flipping the safeties of those Glocks. He flipped the safety off of his, uh, flipped off the safety of his Colt Peacemaker. <laughs> um, uh, what's your way of signaling the audience that cheesy fight scene for comedic effect? Oh boy, I don't know. Um, I would do it through dialogue, like really exaggerated dialogue. Um, there's some examples like there's some ones from that they had in in Berserk um, where uh, you know you'd have a really a buffoonish character so you start with a character being buffoonish maybe he's fat and like you know he'd be fat he'd have a haircut like he's Arnold Schwarzenegger and he would talk about himself nonstop until the fight happened and then and then he'd get his butt kicked or it'd be really comedic like how how it would happen. Um, it's really about and setting it up so that you know it's an, it's going to be comedic. Um, yeah, PO8s are nine millimeters. Most nine millimeters don't sound that scary. Yeah, they really don't. <laughs> See here, six hundred Nitro Express. <laughs> yeah, I've seen Reign of Fire. Okay, Modern Weapons versus Dragons makes me remember Reign of Fire. Have you seen that movie? What did you make of it? I enjoyed it for what it was. I had some friends that were really into it. Uh, but at the same time, even while I was watching it, I'm like, this movie's so stupid. It's such a stupid movie. But 
I just liked it anyway. <laughs> you know, it was okay. Um, sometimes it, you can you can see a movie that's really stupid and then like it anyway. Um, Aquaman has great action scenes throughout. I'll look for those. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at another uh, another movie here um, that I think you guys will will probably appreciate. Uh, so let's take a look at this one. Here we go. This one is from a movie, a little movie called The Duelists, and it's a great example of the things that I've been talking about tonight. Let's take a look at this. Notice most of it's just in the front loading. And this is a handheld camera, but it's not shaky cam stuff, you know. It's it's just a handheld camera so that you feel like you're the camera's mounted on um, on Harvey Keitel's shoulder there. It makes you feel like you're in in kind of a first person mode with the actors. Notice they have an exchange. And I'm going to pause it for a second. Um, if we look at the, the front loading, notice that Harvey Keitel's face is so in control and the other guy is terrified. So it's that front loading of emotion. This is a way that you know that Harvey Keitel has much more skill than his opponent. His opponent is afraid and is circling, trying to avoid the strike. And Harvey knows this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm calling him Harvey because for some reason I can't remember the character's name right now. But I'll remember it the next time I do an analysis on this movie. Because this is one of my one of my favorite movies. There's so much drama in the scene. Notice, notice you didn't see the action there. You didn't see what the swords were doing. Because it's not about the action, guys. It's about the characters. It's about the impact of the action. Notice he drops his sword because he's so confident. You would never, you would never, you would normally never lower your defenses like that. But there's a subtlety to this scene, which is that, you know, his character's doing that because he feels so much more confident about what he's doing. And then he's actually getting into a more defensive stance because he's gonna, he's gonna go in for the blow. Reaction. Or here's the anticipation. Action. Reaction. Anticipation. Action. Reaction. Anticipation. Here's the action. And a reaction. He cut his hand. There we go. Then we just have... A reaction shot and that's all it is oh and there's a uh, ah, there's Matt Easton everybody likes Matt Easton so um, anyway I really like that scene because it shows those things that we were talking about and it shows them so clearly it's uh, each you may feel like oh this is a long action scene with lots of fighting but in some cases you don't even see what the swords are doing the focus is here on the character not on what their swords are doing and that's it's a really important thing to, to note Okay. Dual wielding either with guns or swords is a fun fantasy, but not really feasible in real life. Now, it is possible to dual wield swords in real life. And there was lots of people who did it, but it's not its not necessarily advantageous. Well, there's been a lot of discussion about this, like in HEMA communities. There's lots of historical illustrations of knights having two swords, you know. But you got to be really skilled. Now, the advantage of two swords is what I did in my scene. You didn't. You didn't do this with two swords, like like how it is in I don't know World of Warcraft, where you're like, I can strike twice as fast. It's that you did both at the same time, and so because you could come from two different angles, it made it harder to defend against. But at the same time, having to, you have two sharp objects that could hit you and hurt you. By the way, it's harder to defend with two swords. So usually you have people that cross their swords as a defense, and then you're coming maybe high and low you're doing two different two different attacks to try to get some past somebody's guard so they, there was historical dual wielding of swords but the problem with dual wielding guns is that your line of sight occurs from your main eye to the target with the gun sights in between um, you can't 
you don't if you guys don't know that you have one eye that's dominant, you can do this sometime. Take a take your hands and make a little square. Open both eyes and put that square on some object on the other side of the room. Then close each eye and you'll figure out which eye is your dominant one. Because you'll close one eye and the object will disappear and you'll close the other eye and the object will stay in the in in this in this little box you made. That's your dominant eye, it's the one you see the, the object with. So when you're shooting, you're usually aiming with your dominant eye. Um, for most people, it's their right eye, but for some people, it's left eye. Just It's kind of like being right-handed, left-handed. Um, it has something about the way your neurology develops. I don't know. But you can't really handle two guns that way because you, 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 know, you can only have one thing that's running between your eye and the distant target. So as soon as you put another one here, you, know, you can't accurately gauge what angle that second gun is at. So dual wielding guns is impractical. It'd be, and it doesn't really increase your rate of fire or anything. It'd be better to have two guns, shoot one till it's empty, and then pull the next one and shoot that one till it's empty, like what Cowboys did. So I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> David, if you're using a show field, you can inject all six cylinders simultaneously. Yeah, but cowboys are cowboys are always shooting cult, cult peacemakers. I know how those work. <laughs> you know, if you're shooting a Smith and Wesson, you can inject you can inject all the shells at once too. There was a number of ones that had swing out cylinders and things like that. Um. <laughs> I laughed out loud the first time I played Assassin's Creed Four, and you just shoot each of your six guns once. Um, lots of talk about guns here. Let's see if there's another question. Um, saddest thing about modern movies is the effects and action overall has gotten worse. I think so. I don't think the effects have gotten worse. I think the effects are better than ever. But the action's worse because you can make a great looking spaceship, but if you don't do these things like of anticipation and reaction, the great looking spaceship doesn't really look that great because it has no impact. Film Girl. What do you think of the action scenes in The Magnificent Seven? I enjoyed it myself, even though I thought it was rushed at times. I haven't seen the new Magnificent Seven. I haven't seen. There's just stuff I haven't seen. Um, let's see. What kind of action would you recommend for a story that isn't meant to be about the action, like a romance, for example? Is there an unbelievable scale of action for some settings? I don't think so. Uh, Flaw Icon writes this. Remember the action, it's not really about the action, it's about the reaction. So if you're writing romance and there's an, a an action scene, it's about that impact, you know, uh, how the impact on the relationship is going to be if, if the one person has to get into a fight or they're being threatened, or, you know, something bad happens. Yeah, you want to you wanna go into the detail there, but you don't need to go into gory details about, you know, the sound of the clavicle snapping like a dry twig, right? And you don't need to do that. Um, you could probably just focus on the impact more than the actual action is probably a better plan. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, anyone else find it funny that Universal thought they could reboot their classic monsters into summer action superhero wannabe franchise? Oh, I think that's... You were talking about like the... the they had a Tom Cruise mummy. That's all they do is reboot stuff because it's the it's the safest bet. Um, when you're spending two hundred million dollars, it's the safest bet. How do you balance writing action? It seems to be between glossed over everything and too short, and action-packed pieces that are hard to read from too much. Well, you got to have those moments of you have to have some release. So this is a larger thing with plot. So if there's never a moment for people to stop and talk, then it's going to feel like it's too much action. And if all they do is talk, you're going to feel like it's boring. So. I don't know if there's like a rule of thumb that for each big action set piece, you need to have something that's not action. Characters talking, even if it's for a moment, even if it's just like, we got away, here's a minute for us to talk and discuss what's happening next. And then they, the monsters come again and you have to keep going. So, you know, for each action scene, you probably need some other kind of relief scene to set up the tension for the next scene, to set to for the characters to react to the change in the direction of plot. Um, so if you do two big action scenes in a row, it might be too much. 
Um, but it depends. Like even if I write a scene where it's like a battle, like a battle is a big thing. Within that are moments where the characters can react and talk. Or here's this thing that happened and it resolved and here's the next thing that happens and it resolves so that there's always a resolution in there. You know, they, then, you know, the mana poles folded and ran away to the tree line. Okay. That happened. Oh man, I can't believe we got away from that. Okay. There's a reaction. And then it's like, yeah, but what are we going to do about that? About that cavalry charge over there? Okay. You set up the next one. Any tips for describing supernatural battles where the characters possess their own unique powers ranging from simple to complex? I don't have a lot of... Um... So here's the thing. If the first time you're seeing these powers is in the battle scene, you probably made a mistake. You want to establish what the possibilities are for superhero type characters well before you get to a battle scene. Because if you're trying to establish the expectations during the battle, it's going to disrupt the flow. But also, people aren't going to be sure about what... They're, they're going to have the wrong kind of lack of assurity. They're going to be like, is, is it possible for them to just get out of this or not? Right? It's okay to have like one or two new things happen in a battle. But uh, you don't want to start with trying to expose everything. And there's lots of great examples of how you do this, I guess, the right way. Um so if you look at the beginning of Way of Kings, I've talked about this a lot because it's a great piece of craft. You, you have just an action scene where this character is running on the walls and doing all this magic. You don't really see any other magic. Now, there's other magic present, but you don't really see it uh, because it's not important. You're just trying to show one, um, one character's ability to perform things and you show it through action. So if you do just one character at a time, it's easy. But if there's a bunch of characters and they all have unique powers, establish it beforehand. So like maybe a dude has laser eye cyclops vision. You know, he shot his lasers at this at his enemy, whatever it is. People aren't going to be like, "What? He shot lasers out of his eyes?" You want them to be like, "Okay, yeah, we know that he does that." And so then you can just describe what happens and focus on that the reactions and what those what those mean. Um, I'd be interested to see what Christopher Nolan could do with the Star Wars film. He's been rather quiet after making Dunkirk. Yeah, I don't know. If I were Christopher Nolan, I would just do whatever I wanted to. What are your thoughts on YouTube video essay channels? I used to like the idea of them, but now they seem to just regurgitate Wikipedia info while masquerading as academic or nerdy. I don't really watch them. I, I think mine might be a video essay channel. I don't know. I don't really watch them, so I, I don't have a big opinion. Um, the video essays that I like are center around analysis of current things. So I might watch video essays on gaming, on like a game, right? Or like some event that's happening in the gaming industry. Well, that's not reading Wikipedia. That's a person's analysis of how that's happening. That's interesting to me. I want to know how they constructed their arguments, not, uh, you know, let me let me make this video on the alligator snapping turtle. It's like, no, we don't need to make a video on that. There's plenty of videos on that. Lucas didn't even know what his own vision was in A New Hope. Skywalker was almost a 60-year-old man with an android head. Well, and if you read the first uh, first draft of... This is from Rusty Heckler, going back to Star Wars. If you read the first draft of Star Wars, which I'll put up on Subscribestar if, for anybody that's a subscriber... Um, Skywalker was an aged general originally, and the main character was Justin Light. By the time A New Hope was made, Skywalker, Justin Light was gone, and Skywalker was Justin Light, and Skywalker was really. I mean, like it's it's totally different. You got to read it though. It's a great, it's a great little screenplay to read. Is that original draft of of Star Wars? This is what Star Trek Theory says. <laughs> Mucho respect your old man. I went through basic in 1986 and they told us to squeeze because it keeps you from jerking the trigger. But then we'd get smoked for saying gun. <laughs> it's a rifle. My dad would say guns. Guns are the big category, right? So gun is anything. Rifle's a particular kind of gun. So I don't think he ever, he didn't care that much about that. Um... My dad's uh, MO for a while was just to run 
uh, like the whatever the competition pistol shooting team that's what he did that's what he did for like two years was shoot professionally for the army <laughs> you know um, what a what a cool job that he had for a while I was thinking of um, this is from uh, Moxley I was thinking of surrealist movies like train spotting how would you handle action in a surreal style of writing I don't know because I haven't written that <clears throat> so I don't know how I would handle it other than um, if you write from a first person perspective you get the reaction kind of built into the action you describe it the way that the character perceives it and that's just I guess what you would do um, <laughs> another use of dual wield is that one is normal size while the all find is something smaller more as a defensive tool that's true if you're using rapier so you used to use a rapier and a dagger or rapier and like a sword catcher or sword breaker which was a basically a dagger with little notches and so you could catch the other person's rapier and hold it and then so rapier was almost always paired with a dagger um highland claymore which is not the sword William Wallace used to Braveheart, which is really a, a Zweihander, but um, a basket hilted, uh, broad sword, broad bladed sword. You almost always used with a buckler. It's because you could carry your your sword and your buckler, and so you had a small shield you carried on your belt, and it allowed you a lot of a lot more room. You could use it together like this, or you could use them apart. You know, um, so and you could hit someone with the buckler. Or you could put a spike on the buckler and like poke someone with it if you wanted to. Um, I think there's some examples of that. So dual wielding with like a, a dagger. Yeah, totally. They did it all the time. Um, three swords is a superior method of fighting. One for each hand and one in your mouth. Very powerful stance. Think of like Berserk where he's like, you, uh, you know, you you talk too much when you fight and he like grabs the sword of his teeth and throws him off the sword. Maybe I'll look up that one in a minute. Um, let's look at another. I actually want to look at another scene, uh, scene with y'all. If you will, this one um, is a Peter Jackson. This is um, this is Lord of the Rings, um, and this one is great because we have anticipation, some emotion, right? Look at all the. Uh, these are just shots of emotion. This is what the characters are feeling. We're anticipating bad stuff happening. And you, you know, Tolkien did this by hearing drums in the deep, boom, 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 you know. Um, this is like a, a very good adaptation of what Tolkien did in his book in terms of getting the feeling right. There's an action, and here's a here comes a reaction. They have a cave troll. They have a cave troll. That's the, that's the reaction, right? Then we're going to have some anticipation. Again, just shots of people emoting fear, emoting anger, sternness, the hobbits getting ready to, to fight. And then you're gonna have... This is all anticipation. Then the action's gonna happen. It's pretty simple, actually. So Peter Jackson in these movies, well, I'll take a minute and wax poetic. In the original Lord of the Rings movies, Peter Jackson did very simple, easy to understand action for the most part. In the Hobbit movies, it's way over the top and super stylized. And that's one of the things I didn't like about them. Is that the action, the focus was like how wild the swords were and not this. That he did so well in these movies. Again, this is all tension. We have a little bit of action. And here come the, the orcs. And then, so then, notice you don't even really see a lot of the action. You can see the, the impact, the consequence of the action. You know, a shot of an orc being, having like a arrow sticking out of his face. You know, that's all reaction stuff. And notice they kind of use the shaky cam when they're like in the mix, not, you know, not just standing back. But there's plenty of times where you get a clear view of what somebody's emoting, you know? 
Oh, that was a great shot too with like the, the blood shooting out. But see, the action takes place in such a smaller amount of time than the, the anticipation and the reaction. So this comes in, here's a new threat, and it, most people are gonna stop and react. Anticipation, here's the action. Anticipation, an action, and a reaction. So you see he just does it over and over and over again. It's what makes Lord of the Rings feel good as movies. Um, is just this constant use of being of constantly going back to the characters to show you what the characters are feeling all the time. Um, I think it works really, really well. And I think it's a great example of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Hobbit action scenes remind me a little of Wire Fu from the Hong Kong Wuxia movies. Yeah, so the Wuxia movies... Um, yeah, I, I don't. I like those. I think they're fine, but they just didn't fit with what what he was doing. Um, you know, it just it was so it was so over the top and it was so wild uh, that it was it was almost impossible for me to take any of the the action scenes in the in the Hobbit prequels um, seriously. I'm going to show you one more from uh, Berserk. I don't know. I can't. Sh it's gonna get my. That's gonna get my stuff flagged. Um, I'll show you a different one. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. <laughs> this one's good. All right. Boom. Here it is. This is from the original anime. So. This is another thing that's kind of cool about the, the way Japanese animation just tends to get made. It's because uh, you, you focus on having a highly detailed shot that you kind of pan in and out of rather than doing lots of animation. It kind of keeps it on the cheap side but makes it look very detailed. That's just basically a single frame. You know, an action. Notice there's just a pause for some drama and how calm his eye is. And that's the action. I actually don't know if this is in Japanese or English yet. We'll find out. I know I could split steel. Oh, it's the English version. It's too bad. Easily evades each blow, and just uses one arm to handle his narrow blade. You know, this is internal dialogue. That's kind of breaking the fourth wall, right? He is good. You're telling rather than showing. We could always suspend the duel until you've recovered completely, if you'd rather. Shut up! I win. Let's uh, let's go to a. Uh, let's go to this spot. The spot's good. Again, action, reaction. Everyone reacts. <laughs> it's over. Some anticipation, right? Some tension. Fight, my friend. You'd go to any length to defeat me. But now you can't wield your sword unless I move. I wouldn't mind if you'd rather postpone this. Notice there's a, just a change of emotion. There's like a sly smile. Let me tell you something. In battle, there's only one way you should be using your mouth. And then the action happens. So yeah, that was a good one. I was just thinking about that one. Um, so anyway, that's most of the examples that I had uh, had tonight. Yeah, you got to jump over the shield wall <laughs> to render the shield wall useless, <laughs> like in The Hobbit. Exactly. Why have a shield wall if you can just hop over it? You'd think that they would have thought of this back in ancient times when the Roman maniples were, were putting their scutum shields forward. They would have been like, why don't we just jump on over and see how that works? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, since Fellowship, Peter Jackson's movies declined at a steady linear pace into the gutter burnout or something else bad happened to him i don't know what happened to um to peter jackson and it's not uh, you know i can watch the hobbit movies and see a lot of technical qualities in them 
but the like there's something very much missing from those hobbit movies i'll i'll take another look at them and do some videos on them this year i think because i think they deserve a second like um so <clears throat> the band of the hawk um, what's interesting about Berserk is that it's very influenced by Gothic and Italian realities in the Middle Ages. Uh, Italy was basically run by mercenary bands. Um, all these little city-states uh, relied on mercenaries very extensively um, for defense and for lots of other things. All the little principalities in Germany as well and Bavaria had to, had to rely on mercenaries. So mercenary bands were a big, big deal in Italy and um, Gothic Germany in the middle ages so interesting thing to think about i can't remember the first cowboy bebop episode i'll have to watch it again it's been like 20 years so um <laughs> have i ever written chase scenes i have i have written sort of i have written chase scenes sort of um uh not like car scenes not car chase scenes so car chase scenes or any kind of chase scene, I think you just do the same thing. Um, you, I would put in, so I put in each event that shows that they're going to a new place. If they're running down a hallway, they turn, now they're in a big gallery. Um, they're running through the forest, he hops over a rock, now they're in a different, now he's jumped right into a bog. Um, so you show the things that change rather than things that stay the same. Uh, and that way you can get through the chasing pretty quickly. My thing earlier about the action versus gloss was meant to be about battle. Sorry for not clarifying. Yeah, so for battle, you do want to gloss over certain things, right? Um, if they don't, they don't have a lot of drama involved in them, just kind of skip them, you know, or just describe them briefly and get to the stuff that has the big impact. Play, places where people get hurt places where main characters die those, those are the important moments that you really want to focus on and Tolkien was actually quite good at this if you read his battle scenes because it'd be kind of like blurry explaining and then boom something important for a couple pages and then kind of taking a step back and then boom something really important um, is happening um, and, and it worked out pretty well um, if you were to read Robert Jordan he does it a different way is that he would switch perspectives and so each time you switch perspectives you're going to something important happening and otherwise the battles described very loosely from you know parents perspective or whoever happens to be there um, so Robert Jordan did it a very different approach but one that works pretty well uh, I think so you can do either one um, I think it's probably easier to execute changing perspectives because that way um, you don't have to manage prose transitions going from something that's more third person personal to more omniscient, which Tol Tolkien was able to do pretty easily. You don't have to manage that as much. You just always kind of keep it personal and um, you describe all the less important events secondhand. It works. Um, all right, so I think that's probably going to be it for tonight. Uh, my voice is kind of given out. I'm, I've had a pretty sore throat for a couple days. So hopefully um, that was interesting and you had fun watching a couple movie scenes with me. Um, I like to look at movies because whenever I think about an action scene, I start with a visualization. And go ahead and ask any questions that you have left over and I'll try to get to them right now. Um, but I try to think about what I visualize it and then I'm describing what I visualize and trying to drop in some of those color words to really... Uh, give some of the impact uh, to the reader that they that they want. So if you look at movies, all of these mediums tend to execute action in a similar way when it's effective. Um, but of course, a movie is going to show a reaction on an actor rather than describe it the way you would in a book. Uh, and a comics can show a reaction of an actor or a character rather than describe it in the way in your book. So you're switching to prose. You know, you're switching around. Thank you for the for the one New Zealand dollar. Kingster, I really appreciate that. Um, let's take a look at any any last questions. <sighs> what do you make of the Hoth battle, given your rules? I ask because the ground combat gets a lot of screen time, but it doesn't focus on any characters. See the Adats versus Rebel Infantry turrets. I see I see those as just filler between the stuff that's impactful. Um, so there's you know it just kind of shows that there's a battle and it's kind of glossy and you kind of glossed over. Except for when they like blow up the shield generator, that has an impact. 
Otherwise, you're going to like the ships and them trying to figure out how to like tie up the the, the walkers, the ATATs, or I was called ad ads, whatever. Sue me. Um, so they're you know for trying to figure that out. Luke crashing his ship. The the impactful stuff is really Han and Leia getting ready to get out and Luke crashing his ship. And so the reason that the you show the shooting in between is just basically to remind you that there's a battle happening. There's nothing really pivotal being shown in those particular scenes. Um, so that's an interesting one. Uh, I actually think that it's it's a pretty well done battle scene, and um, you know there's been there was a good little exposition building up to it too. Uh, there's a lot of drama with that, so there's a lot of drama building up to it, and you still see that same that same sort of execution, an anticipation, and then a reaction. There's an anticipation, and then maybe like Luke's ship gets shot and his gunner is dead, and then you see Luke realize that that his friend's dead, and there's a reaction. You know, those things are good. Um, how would you approach a battle of mental telepathy as opposed to real physical action? I do not know how I would approach that. Um, I don't know. I, I, if I were to write it in prose, I might say things that's, uh, you know, he he pushed back against the other person's. It depends on the magic system or whatever you're using. You know, he pushed back. You know, he imagined that uh, he imagined he was pushing through like a sword. Um, and there was resistance, you know, I would, I would try to use those kind of words to try to describe it. I don't really know. Cause I've never done that. Um, is it bad to swap between present tense and past tense in a sci-fi fantasy novel due to a lot of action? Absolutely. It is bad. Stick with one tense throughout the entire book if possible. And one perspective. Uh, now I've broken that rule. Uh, I had a chapter that in Muramasa, which has lots of action in it. I wanted to read some more stuff from this, but I'm like, I didn't mark it. Um, so there's a chapter that's written in first person. The whole chapter is, you know, it's set up before then. I'm going to tell you a story in first person. Um, but yeah, you need to have one tense, one perspective. So if it's third person perspective, <clears throat> it needs to be third person the whole book. Don't, don't be changing perspectives in the middle of it unless you're... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Go ahead, Hillary Clinton on you guys coughing. Um, unless it's like a letter. So if it's a letter, like in Dracula or something like that, then yeah, that'd be first person. But don't switch between first person and third person. Do not switch between present tense and past tense. It feels awful. Never, in fact, present tense should be avoided. I know that there are books written in present tense that have been very popular recently. I would not write in present tense ever. I would never write in present tense. It feels weird in narrative. It does not feel right. It makes you feel like you're reading a screenplay. Scre <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> like I said, I'm quite sick. But um, screenplays are written in present tense. But your prose should not be. I would never write a book in present tense, Meals Beast. Just wouldn't ever write a book in present tense. You can do whatever you want. I'm telling you what I would do. I would never write a book in present tense. It's and I and if a book is written in present tense, I find it unreadable. It just feels very wrong to me, and it creates a different style of prose that I think in, is inherently limiting. I'll talk about it some other time. I think the uh, what are those books? The Hunger Games books were written in like present present tense first person or something. I don't remember. It was it was written in a very awkward style, but it's easy to understand if you're a kid, because present tense is really easy to understand. Michael jumps away, Janice shoots him in the leg, right? Versus Michael jumped away, Janice shot him in the leg. But there's a lot more opportunity for color if you're writing in past tense. Um. How about the predator kill me scene? Good action and reaction. I love that. Yeah, I love Predator. Uh, and I love the final scenes of Predator. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then it completely switches. Kill me. It switches, you know. Um, when he has the Predator and the Predator's laughing as he's going to commit suicide. Uh, 
What's your take on the writing uh, for the English dub of Ghost Stories? Haven't seen it. Do you mind if I ask my old question from last week before we end things tonight? Uh, go ahead. Ask ask your old question. Um, that mental telepathy battle reminds me of occupancy from Harry Potter. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, do you think it's better to write action fight scenes from the character's point of view or the author's? Um, so I'm guessing third person versus first person. I'd say you use one perspective the whole book. So if you wrote the rest of it in third person, you should write action scenes in third person as well. Don't don't change the perspective if you can. Um, you know, I switched perspectives, but it's really, oh, it's a whole chapter and he's telling a bunch of backstory and he's telling it like around a campfire. Let me tell you my story. Um, <laughs> sorry i must have missed something it's hard to keep track of the chat because it keeps jumping around um what are your thoughts on a sci-fi setting i made focusing on a hoplophilic republic whose military is dedicated to destroying anything that seeks to immunitize <laughs> the escatchen escatchaton um i don't know if i can answer that i don't know why hoplophilic i'm not sure i know what that word means so i'm going to trans try to translate it into regular english <laughs> you have a hegemonic republic uh, whose military is dedicated to destroying anything that seeks to become imminent in its domain um you're just putting romans in space I think it's great. <laughs> I think that I would like that actually. Um, I think, uh, and it's probably been done. You know, the Romulans are Romans in space. Hence why they're called Romulans. <laughs> you seem like a moral man, so you're safe from Hillary Clinton syndrome. <laughs> With present tense, it almost feels like I should awkwardly be in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I outline, so okay, Lol Icon says, I outline in present tense subconsciously. I find it hard to outline in past tense, unless it's a flashback. I outline in present tense as well, but I write in past tense because there's a lot more options. Um, I haven't seen any Goblin Slayer. Everyone's talking about Goblin Slayer. I haven't watched any shows in a long time, man. Like I... I, my free time is writing, playing with my kids, but mostly writing, reading, occasionally a game, right? Like I got to play some World of Warcraft the other night. It was fun. Hoplophile. Hoplophile is weapon love. So a hoplite, yeah, a hoplite is a, is a Roman formation. I mean, that's a, <laughs> right? That, that, uh, that would be a shield and a, and a spear or, or Greek, right? The hoplite uh, is a Greek formation. So I should have known that. Um, so yeah it's great it's more about destroying any th faction that seeks to make uh, heaven on earth yeah well I don't know I think you can sell it I, I, for sure um, so yeah I think you could do that I mean um, so I mean I would probably read The Prince by Machiavelli if you want to think about how you manage statecraft and things like that because being you know what i would probably set up as a as a conflict within this is people who are very absolutist on crushing anyone that is uh <clears throat> is attempting to create heaven on earth and then uh people who are like well that's a good way to get yourself killed because you have to be more political um you create rebels and problems for us How about writing action scene, fighting a storm, a ship caught up in a squall? I don't know. I haven't written it. <clears throat> Goblin Slayer is okay. I liked it, but a lot of people are butthurt over its opening scene. I don't. Uh, now I have to watch it. I have to see what the butt hurts about. You you got a trigger word for me, which is butt hurt. Whenever people's butts are hurting, I have to know why, because um, the butt hurt. 
Goblin Slayer is all right, but I think it tries to be Berserk and Shock Value without really adding depth to it. And the thing about the Shock Value of Berserk is that it wasn't just for Shock Value. There was impacts to the characters and impacts to the world. It was part of the whole thing. Seriously, how long until J.K. Rowling retcons Harry Potter into Harry Potter? Give it time. Anything is possible. So I can imagine her putting an endorsement on a reprinting of the books with like a bunch of gender swapping things for gay kids or something. I don't know. I could totally see her doing it. And it, it wouldn't surprise me, but it would it would be bad. <laughs> the more The more political she gets, the more ridiculous she looks to me. ATATs would have had servos so they would not trip over wires. Look up servo. <laughs> no, don't. It's fantasy. Don't look too deep into that. Um, better yet, write another book where he transitions and leaves Jenny for Malfoy. Oh, boy. What are some good introductory books for war in history? I don't know. I would say figure out what period you like to know about and find books for it. That's the best I can do. That's the best I can give you, because every period has its own way of waging war, its own set of mores and politics. It's all different. David, I stumbled upon your videos randomly. I am a writer and wanted to ask you a question. Would it be possible to create a book with multiple point of view characters in a single chapter? Absolutely. It's been done many times, and you can do it. Michael Crichton did it excellently, and he would often just put the name of the character. That was the point of view character. Boom. Um, so you could do that. Many people have done it. Um, you can even switch points of view within a single, without any kind of breaks. James Clavell did it. Just go read Shogun or um, King Rat was one of my favorites. He also wrote The Great Escape. Right? You can the the screenplay for that. Uh, in opening scenes, a manly man is sh in shining armor saves a princess character from literal rape. Yeah, dude, well, that's what happened in freaking Venom here, right? <clears throat> or, uh, or did I... <laughs> Look, what, what's, what's this guy saying here? Here you go. I'm gonna get my money out of you somehow. <laughs> uh... Maybe I'll have to take my pay some other way. Yeah, what's that? And then he grabs her face. What do you think he's trying to do to her? That's something that I, I notice gets, it's just like the go-to is like raping women. It's it's a, it's like a kick the dog thing, right? You know, it's a, it's an awful thing. Um, and uh, definitely plays on the, on the, on the power, power dynamics there. Um, You can have a lot of people talk to you about their hemorrhoids. Uh, J.K. Rowling has gone full SGW. It's freaking hilarious to watch. I, I don't follow her on Twitter anymore. I used to follow more authors. Now I follow Stephen King, and he's the same way. He's got full like Trump derangement syndrome. Nothing he says is cognizant anymore. I'm like, dude, you're getting senile. It's like, no, it just I think people have had like a mental break because of how different Donald Trump is from every other president that's ever lived. <laughs> Let's call Hermione Herman at that point. Yes. Um, oh, wait. Missed a bunch. I just saw a good video essay about adaptational attractiveness. Talked about Hermione losing a lot in the film adaptation. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the films are not as good as the books in a lot of cases. Most people who really love Harry Potter, they like the books. You know, and the films... Films might be how they got into the books, but I think the attachment to the books is way more profound than the movies. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Like it does the setting a lot better. The movies they drop most uh, a big portion of the elements of the setting just go missing at the third movie and never come back. So like they used to wear wizard robes and then they just wear street clothes because the actors look more you know look more attractive in normal clothes than they do in weird robes that they had to make you know there's a lot of things like that yeah someone says they think the hottest character was the french chick from that other magic school i met that actress at one point 
<laughs> I, I'm, I'm like 99% sure I met her at one point. Um, I was playing guitar somewhere. And like she was there with like, I don't know, her boyfriend or something. Um, so I'm like almost sure that I met her like in LA or something at some point. It, it was so long ago. And, and I was just like, man, it was. I think she was uh, the person from that movie. And someone's like, yeah, I think she was too. It's like, okay. I don't remember the too much else besides that. Venom and shining armor. <laughs> to be fair, most celebrities on Twitter tend to be very liberal. They are just the most obnoxious about it on Twitter. Yeah, I, Twitter's the worst. It's so it, that's just where people are like, I gotta just, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of screaming, and no subtlety. Sexual assault baddies are a huge cliche, but the problem I think some stories, particularly the anime, have is that it can be shot written in a way that can almost come across as meant to arouse. Probably was meant to arouse on some level. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, okay. I think that's. I'm going to call it here for tonight, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll see you guys next time. If I missed one of your questions... Leave it in the next one, and I'll try to get to it. Um, I'm going to try to post. I'm going to try to have the next show up early and, like, have that out on social media so, you know, you can put questions ahead of time, and I can just answer them at the beginning of the show. Um, what if there was a new literary phrase called shooting the dog? It kind of sounds like a – kind of sounds like doing heroin or something like that. So, anyway, thanks so much, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, blah, 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 blah. New book is coming out. It's actually not new. It's the old books, but just in one big volume. Um, all the illustrations are still in it. It'll look like this, except obviously with the not for resale thing won't be on it. Um, and this is this is what the, the cover will look like. So um, you could pre-order that. The paper book will probably be out Friday. That's when I'm going to make it go live. And then um, you get the ebook for free if you want to do that. More books are coming out this year, including a third one in this series um, and uh, some other weird stuff that I have planned. And I've got a bunch of books I need to edit and put out um, that kind of got they got finished through the drafting phase. And I didn't really go back and and get them to the place where I want them to be to release them. So hopefully those will come out this year, too. Hopefully a busy, busy year and more music, more music, hopefully, too. So uh, make sure you're on my mailing list, dbspress.com slash list. And um I'll see you guys uh, next time.